Welcome back everyone to the University of Idaho and University of Wyoming Extension Sheep and Goat webinar series. Um, I'm Melinda Ellison, University of Idaho Extension Sheep Specialist. You have two other hosts as well for this webinar series. One would be Carmen Willimore, who is an Extension Educator in Lincoln County for the University of Idaho, and Whit Stewart, who is the um, University of Wyoming Extension Sheep Specialist. Uh, and it is my pleasure today to um, introduce Dr. Barrett Bangora of the University of Wyoming and the Wyoming State Vet Lab, who's gonna visit with us about coccidia management. So um, we're really lucky to have you today and I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Thanks a lot. I'm very excited to have this opportunity and um, to be able to visit with you today. And the topic for today is coccidia management in sheep and goats. So, um, Coccidia are probably something most of you are aware of. And today we're gonna cover a little bit of the basic information like um, occurrence impact, what are they, what do they do? And then move on to the lion's share of the presentation, which is prevention and control options. And they are actually a combination of both management strategies and treatment options, and they really go hand in hand. So one is not really efficient without the other. All right, so that would lead me to the first poll question actually already. If Melinda would be able to pull that up, that would be great. Just as an introduction for me, um, so I know about you, um, do you know, assume that coccidiosis issues may be present on your operation? What do you think? Awesome, thank you very much. I appreciate that feedback. It's just good for me to know where we're starting from essentially. So it seems like most of you may have um, potentially some issues with coccidiosis. Um, some of you might not even be sure and some of you can exclude that and that's great. Um, so um, it seems to be somewhat relevant and that is in line, just see, in line with what we see globally. So not only in like the Western US, but about everywhere where we, where we have commercial um, sheep and goat production, we see that this is a widespread issue. And we see it in all climates and all types of herd management. While the greatest risk is obviously if we have intensive farming, maybe indoors or outdoors, that doesn't really matter a lot because the parasites are pretty hardy and are able to, um, sorry, I just see something here in the chat. Sorry for that. Okay. Um, so, and are able to survive a lot of different environmental conditions, be it, you know, temperature um, changes, very cold temperatures, they're good with that. Um, is it dryness? Yes, they can definitely live with that. Um, there's only a few things that really kill them, and so we see it in a lot of different um, settings. Though mostly um, all ages are affected by coccidiosis and can carry the parasite, um, it is actual an actual problem mainly in the young animals. Sorry for that, I'm just trouble. I just have trouble too. Oh, all right. And that actually, actually would lead me to the next question real quick. Sorry for sort of bothering you with that in the beginning. Um, but my question would be um, about your experience. So how would you go about judging if you have coccidiosis on a farm? So which um, signs would you see as critical in judging that? Yeah, I agree. So probably the most, the easiest sign would be the, the diarrhea in the calves or sorry, in the lambs and kids. Sorry, I just came from a cattle presentation, so I'm a little off. Um, but obviously like the, the general condition um, of the lambs and kids is also an issue. And it's interesting that some of you recognize like general herd productivity or other diseases as a way to see if coccidiosis is sort of an issue because that's really true. And we will get there in a couple of slides that these are really um, signs that you may notice in a herd that is severely affected with coccidiosis, even though the older animals are not um, having the parasite still, they will still suffer from the consequences later on. So um, when we talk about the signs which help us to sort of 
see if coccidiosis is present, uh, we generally differentiate between two types of coccidiosis, and that would be clinical and subclinical. If we start with a clinical coccidiosis, this is the one where you really can see the diarrhea. You can see that animals may either lose weight or grow really slowly. And this is very similar for both sheep and goats. So you would mostly see um, sort of soft stool or, you know, watery diarrhea, and you can you can tell from just looking at the hind legs here that there is something going on. Same is true for the lambs. So if you have severe coccidiosis, um, you will notice that um, quite easily. If you are talking about subclinical coccidiosis, that's sort of a different issue. And there's a big question mark here just because it's really hard to tell when animals are infected. There is really no distinctive sign of acute disease present. Um, and this is the type of coccidiosis where we still run into trouble like reduced weight gain and also some hidden effects later on, but it's not obvious. So you wouldn't necessarily notice, but the weight gain might be slower than in herds that are not affected by um, coccidiosis a lot. And it's like a, you know, like a very slow effect. So it would give you lower feed conversion rates and just, sort of hamper your overall farm efficiency, but it's hard to, to get a hold of that because there are no um, signs you can see in the very young animals. And this is something we see quite commonly that you still have an impact of the disease, even though it's not um, really obvious to you. This is a table that summarizes um, the long-term um, effect of coccidiosis on an operation. So this is a recent study from th three years ago, and they looked at goats. And in that case, they compared goat herds uh, with coccidiosis issues to goat herds that don't have that, and sort of figured out what are actual um, downsides to having the coccidiosis on an operation, apart from having the acute disease in the kids. And what they had seen is that in both cases where they really could observe clinical signs and also where they could not observe clinical signs but could show by lab diagnostics that their coccidia are an issue here, um, they have seen a lot of different um, problems. So it started with um, feed conversion ratio and weight gain that was reduced in both cases. Um, weight loss in some individual animals was observed. And then um, also a lot of you know, additional diseases that were sort of fostered um, by the animals suffering from coccidiosis, and that also resulted in more um, treatment costs. And then also long-term effects like, you know, uh, milk, wool, slash hair production, um, they had seen that in both cases. So that means that the overall efficiency of the farm production was reduced. And also carcass um, deletion, what they looked for is in slaughterhouses. So they actually had less money uh, from the slaughterhouse in the very end. And also fertility of the females of the uh, use and dose. So they got pregnant a little later um, than their peers without coccidiosis would. So there were a lot of hidden effects that people wouldn't necessarily attribute to coccidiosis, but that are so somewhat linked on the long-term still. Um, when we look into the effects of coccidiosis, I don't want to bother you a lot with it, but I would like to go over the life cycle of coccidia um, very briefly, because that helps understand how it sort of perpetuates in a herd and how you know the real damage happens in the animal. And some of you may have heard a lot about that already and I apologize for potentially repeating that to you, um, but it all starts with, um, the oral uptake of the parasite. And the parasite will then sort of hatch in the intestine and then undergo several replication cycles, which means that one parasite stage that is um, ingested will end up producing up to millions of new parasites within um, that infected animal. And after the different um, replication cycles here, asexual and sexual, in the very end, we will see the new parasite stages excreted with a feces. And in this case, um, what is interesting, those um, stages, also called oocysts, they are not infected right away. So if the next, um, say, in this case, lamp, 
would feed on it and eat it accidentally, nothing would really happen because they are not ready to infect. What they need is a second part of the life cycle and the environment. And here we would see like the maturation of that oocyst. So inside we will see parasite stages form that are the actual infective stages. And um, that will then be infective to the next host. So we have to undergo the whole life cycle with the internal part of about two to three weeks. And then the environmental development, um, which is sort of um, variable in length. It depends a lot on the climate and conditions, but it's mostly a, about three to seven days um, until the next round of oocysts is ready to infect. So the whole life cycle is about a month. Um, from infection of one host to the infection of the next generation of hosts, if you will. What happens during that um, internal development of the parasites, uh, which is essentially a multiplication, um, that the gut cells are damaged because those parasites, they are inside um, the host cells, so they will invade individual gut cells and then destroy them when they are done with their development. Um, so, especially if you have high infection doses and there's a lot of parasites um, invading those gut cells and destroying those gut cells, you will end up with a lot of um, gut damage, obviously. And this is a gut from a goat, so actually a goat kid. And you can see here that there are those white dots around, uh, which is indicative for an inflammation. And then you also can see that part of the intestine is reddish, um, bloody, which is also not a good sign, obviously, for the function of that gut. And the second picture is just a close-up of this part of um, the intestine. And you can see here all those nodules, whitish nodules, which um, are inflammation where the parasites are multiplying. And that obviously um, does hamper the gut function and does lead to that diarrhea that we see if there is enough of it going on. And also there are, you know, a little bit of bleedings around, which is also um, a severe sign of inflammation here. So having that said, and I will come back to that uh, a little bit later, obviously due to the high multiplication within a host animal, we will always um, deal with a herd disease and the turnover of the parasite within a month, roughly comprising the internal and environmental um, development. Will, uh, will lead to a quick contamination of you know, your um, pasture or housing. If you have um, the lambs or kids that are born first and then sort of until the last lambs or kids are born in the season. So obviously there will be an issue. The longer it goes on, the more of the parasites will be around. And the very start is if we look at you know, start of the lambing or kidding season, which might be January or March, depending on the operation and the location, obviously. Um, so those um, first born in this example lambs would be exposed to a comparatively low number of parasite stages or oocysts. So the ewes um, or does would excrete um, very low numbers. And then there would also some of the parasites always overwinter on pasture or in the housing pens. Um, this is what the first lambs would take up here. And obviously it's not good for them, but they would have like a, mm, I would say a, a moderate problem with it because they have quite a low infection dose. So they will have some inflammation going on, which we've just seen. They will have some diarrhea potentially but they will not have huge problems. It will not be lethal for them because they only take up low numbers. So it's not a very severe damage. But what they do is they multiply those few oocysts that they have um, taken up very efficiently and will excrete millions, millions of new oocysts in the very end. And that is a problem for all generations of or groups of um, lambs and kids that come thereafter because they will be exposed to this high number of um, parasite stages. So they will ingest a high infection dose and um, accordingly, they will have a lot of damage in the intestine. So they will suffer a lot. And while they do so, they will still go on multiplying it. So 
um, the closer you come to late spring and summer, the more of a problem will be around um, just based on how it spreads and how it sort of um, is multiplied over time. But major question here is how and when to come in with control measures. And that is something that is very, um, uh, I would say individual for each operation. Um, but potentially you would want to sort of prevent this step where there is a huge amount of parasite stations around that will impact the health of your herd. Um, this is a similar graph, just showing one example from uh, a GOAT study that we did. And um, you can see here that those are the study days here. And this is the percentage of animals that is positive for coccidia. And you will see in the very first um, three weeks, there's not a lot going on because those animals have this internal development. So they might be infected, but we couldn't find any of the parasites in the feces yet because they were all within their internal development. And only at the end of that, we could find the first positives, uh, which were only a few animals. But those obviously did contaminate um, the area so much that um, about three weeks later, or even a little less, we could see a, a large peak here. So essentially, the first will um, serve as multipliers and then sort of make sure that the whole herd is affected in the very end. And the same, if we just um, put it into sort of relation, um, to time of the year. So this would be a, um, a flock where we would see um, first uh, lambs in March. So there would be um, sheep here. Um, and the season would go through June. And obviously um, the infection dose would sort of um, rise over time. And as the animals would be um, more um, sick, the later it is in the year. So um, one thing to mention here is also that there is sort of an immunity, which is a good thing, to all animals that have been infected. So once they have been infected, um, they will not be very susceptible to new infections. So once they underwent the whole life cycle of the parasite, their body sort of knows, their immune system knows what it's dealing with. And the next time they are infected, they will have um, still a little bit of parasite development going on and they will still excrete a little bit of the parasites, but they will not have um, a lot of disease signs because their immune system can kick in early and can sort of reduce the problems here. Um, of course, there are a lot of contributing factors. So not every animal will react similarly to the same infection. Um, when we look at clinical disease, that would mostly be animals um, up to six months of age. There are more factors contributing like warm, moist or wet environment, which is um, just due to the fact that those external stages, if you remember, have the environmental development phase. So if they have a warm and moist environment, they will be much quicker in uh, maturating and getting to the infective stage. And this will sort of um, increase the turnover of the parasite and will um, lead to a higher contamination in that specific operation. Then obviously uh, hygiene is very important here. So if there is um, not a lot of feces removal possible or happening, um, then the, that would lead to um, a lot of oocysts staying in the environment. And so the infection pressure would be higher. Animal stress, that would sort of go back to the animal susceptibility. So obviously there are points in life of those um, young animals where they are specifically susceptible to diseases in general, including coccidiosis. So if we are talking about the weaning stage, um, the separation from their moms, that would be, of course, um, a stage where they are very susceptible to disease. Then the climate may play a role as it's sort of um, indicated here, if you have like a harsh winter or something they are born in, obviously that does not help their immune system. Um, then if you change your feet um, abruptly, that would be not, that would not be a good thing, obviously. Um, shipping would be, yeah, again, decreasing their immune system abilities. 
And then of course, secondary infections. So coccidia and secondary infections sort of go hand in hand. That means if you have other pathogens around, that will certainly um, aggravate the signs of coccidiosis that you see. And the other way around, um, coccidia will also aggravate um, the signs of other diseases around. And then um, high animal density, we touched on that before, that especially intensive farming is at risk here, just because um, there is a much easier transmission of high loads from one animal to the other. So that leads us to the, the major part of the um, presentation or our visit today. Um, and that is what can we do for strategic control? So strategic control obviously um, is something you would wanna do because it's a herd disease. So you would not so much focus on individual animals, but you would want to protect your herd from this um, infection. And that leads us to the next question. I would just would like to get your feedback. What do you think at this point? Um, what are important aspects? So what are like the screws you can really um, screw to make sure you can sort of um, limit the spread of coccidiosis here? Awesome, I appreciate these answers because they reflect very well what um, I would think about that. So management and hygiene are obviously our top two. Um, and then targeted drug use is important, but it's not like your major go-to um, measure, at least not as a like standalone tool. And then feeding obviously um, may play into it. And I agree completely with that. So feeding is important because you wanna keep the overall health of your animal. So, um, Going from here, we will go over the different aspects and what you can potentially do about it. And most of you might already do a lot about it. So we will cover management, hygiene, feeding, and the targeted coccidiosis control. So starting with the management, and there's a lot, you know, that you already do for a lot of reasons, because I mean, coccidiosis is only like a small part of the equation when it comes to the health of your um, animals. Um, but I just want to sort of reflect on it from the angle of coccidiosis prevention. Um, I'm very much aware that there is a lot you can do already um, or you're doing already just because you um, want to maintain the health status from a lot of points of view. So the first thing when it comes to management is um, limiting the infection pressure. So obviously you don't want your animals to take up a high amount of um, coccidia, so they don't have a lot of damage in the gut, they don't have a lot of inflammation in the gut, and they can go through the infection with as little disease as possible. So one point to consider here is the group size. Obviously, if you have less animals in a group, there is um, less risk um, that you will have a huge spread at a time. If you sort of divide your animals in smaller groups, um, you might have one or two of those groups breaking with coccidiosis, but it might be that the other groups still remain fine. While if they are all together, um, sort of spreading uncontrolled. Then the group composition, um, this is more about the age groups. So obviously if you have very young and susceptible lambs or kids and you put them into the same area with um, older animals that are just excreting those oses, those very young animals will be hit by a high dose. While if you keep them apart and have those susceptible um, youngsters extra or separate, that would help you sort of lowering the infection pressure because once they come into the area where the other animals were, it might be that, you know, some um, natural um, death of the parasite already occurred. So the actual infection dose may be lower. Also, you may clean in between. Um, so that will really help. Then rotating pastures. Um, I know this is something a lot of operations can just not do because it, it needs a lot of land and it does need a lot of organizational background to be able to do that. But if you can, that's a good thing. Just because even though those um, oses in the environment, they are very hardy, and can withstand a lot of different stresses, there's one thing they really don't like and that is UV light. So if you have a lot of natural light on your pasture and you give it a couple of, um, say at least two or three weeks, that will um, kill most of the parasites. 
So if you could uh, manage with rotating pastures that you put your youngsters on the pastures that are um, supposedly having a low um, number of surviving coccidia, that would certainly help the uh, health of them. Then um, that's also something that is obvious. Avoid feed and water contamination. Just make sure if you maybe can have elevated feeders if it's in-house um, and maybe also elevated water um, sources if it's in-house, that would certainly be a good thing just so they don't eat it consistently. The second point um, regarding um, coccidiosis is the animal susceptibility. And that would mean you would want your animals to be as healthy as possible coming into the coccidia infection so they can deal with it much better and don't um, express a lot of clinical signs. So first thing is stress reduction, obviously. Um, I mean, there's a lot of, you know, trained handling where you just make them, you know, being comfortable with you being around so it doesn't stress them out. And there's a lot of factors coming into that also like cleanliness and climate. There's a lot going on um, to reduce the stress and also vaccination schedules because those vaccinations are preventing concurrent diseases. So there's no vaccination against coccidiosis, but if you vaccinate in, uh, against other diseases, be it respiratory diseases, be it other intestinal pathogens, that will help a lot um, for the animal to be able to deal with the coccidiosis properly. Colostrum, I don't think that's a big deal. I think that's um, pretty common that you can make sure that the colostrum is um, taken up. The colostrum does not protect them against coccidiosis again, but it does protect them against other diseases, which helps dealing with coccidiosis. And reduce secondary infection goes along the same lines um, just to make sure that the immune system is good and can focus on the coccidiosis if it comes up. So when it comes to feeding, um, obviously that's very basic. So you would want to be your, um, you would want your animal um, to be in a good overall condition and the immune system to be stable. <clears throat> and again, I, I figure that this is something you do anyways for a lot of good reasons. So um, you would sort of um, phase in um, new feed and make sure that nutrients, minerals, and vitamins are, you know, uh, in a reasonable amount. Um, this is probably something to be of higher relevance, I would say, if you're not on pasture, because if they're on pasture and um, feed on the grass, there's not a lot you can do about it. And, uh, and uh, apart from, you know, having extra mineral mixes and maybe some corn mixes or whatever. Um, but if you have an in-house farm, you can definitely um, have a lot of control about that. Then um, hygiene is essentially a part of the management, right? So um, what I think is a simple thing to do, um, though it might not be you know, obvious or complicated um, at first sight, but um, if you care for your animals, it would be good when each morning when you start out with clean equipment and clean boots and stuff, um, you would start with the young animals just to work from the susceptible to the immune. So you don't start with like the older ones and then go and mechanically transport with your boots and your equipment um, the coccidia into the pen of the susceptible young animals. Um, then have those elevated feeders, which is great if you're having a sheep operation. In goats, it's so so because goats, I mean, they love climbing and it's really hard to keep them efficiently from, you know, contaminating the feed, but it may help at least a little bit. Then avoid having hot spots. That, those are mostly spots around uh, water sources on pasture or even in house where it's a lot of moisture. Uh, which is helping the parasites to survive and to quickly turn into the infective stage. So if you try and take extra care of that and put, you know, in-house, maybe put a little more bedding on that spot, um, that would help to, to prevent the high dose infections. Cleaning, I think that's also um, something I don't really have to mention. Um, to make sure that you remove the fecal contaminations from the environment and feed and water. Um, so you remove the coccidia with them. Disinfection is a topic um, which is probably only relevant if you have in-house operations. Um, 
because of your outdoors, obviously disinfection is not really feasible, except for some parts of the equipment maybe. But if you're indoors, that might really be a good way to lower the infection pressure. Um, most of the disinfectants that are on the market are not effective against coccidia. So they are not um, destroyed by alcohol. They are not destroyed by um, quaternary um, ammonia preparations like uh, rejuvenol or something like that. So they would easily just survive that. From what is on the market, really only bleach is efficient. And you would have to leave it for at least two hours to make sure that it kills the coccidia. And even then, um, it will not be 100%, it might be 90%, which is you know, not eliminating it, but it might at least help lowering infection pressure and help those animals to get through the infection uh, more easily. Um, and then it comes to um, targeted prevention. And there's a lot of um, questions um, like which age group um, we're talking about. If we're talking about very, very young animals, like under two weeks of age, um, they might be harder to treat or harder to, um, yeah, to provide with a preventive treatment because they are just not eating a lot of um, feed already or of hard solid feed. And most of the anticoxidians come with in feed formulation. So that's really hard. If we are talking old animals that eat um, a lot of solid feed, um, that's much easier to handle. Then we would have to consider the husbandry system itself. So if we are thinking about indoors um, and, you know, very intensive versus extensive or outdoors, there are different options, um, sort of what, what part of um, the different um, prevention measures is really achievable and makes sense. And then also the firm coccidiosis history. So do you know on your operation that maybe you see a lot of clinical cases already in, you know, in the first uh, groups of animals that are born, or do you usually see it a little later? That would also sort of determine where to and when to start with um, targeted prevention and control. So there's a lot of different aspects and there's some basic rules, but there is really not like a one fits all uh, recipe. So that's really something that needs to be figured out on a farm by farm or operation by operation level, um, because there are so many aspects to be considered. And that would lead me to the next question, actually. So what do you think if you did everything right on your operation, what would be your chances to eliminate coccidia? Right, thank you very much for answering that. So um, I was assuming I would break bad news to you, but I'm really sorry to disappoint quite a few people here. So actually there's really, um, no chance to eliminate them completely. Um, so the basic rule when we talk about targeted prevention and control of coccidiosis is you're, you're never trying to eliminate the presence of the coccidia because you just won't get there because they are so um, robust and so widespread. There are so many of them that it's really impossible to really get rid of them unless you close your operation for two years and do nothing on it, that may help. Um, but what we are really focusing on is to, um, to prevent coccidiosis as a disease. So to, to lower the infection pressure to a point where animals can deal with it nicely. And therefore we have a couple of measures that are really targeted measures apart from those uh, management and feeding and um, hygienic measures. And that would be um, first of all, and most importantly, the use of any coccidial drugs. Um, then we would have supportive care and also um, so, some alternative measures are investigated at the moment uh, more and more um, to open more like options for the operations. So um, when we're talking about any coccidial treatments, again, that opens a lot of questions. So which drugs would you use? Which animals need to be treated? Like which animal groups? Um, how would you treat them? When would you treat them? And I would have one more question for you at this point. Um, just asking how many of you um, do use any coccidial drugs at all? 
All right, so it seems like more than half of you do use them um, consistently and about 20% do use them um, sporadically. So that's quite a lot. So it might be worth to look um, a little more into the details of um, efficient use. Um, so when we look at the different types of um, anticoxidial drugs that are on the market today, we roughly divide them into coccidiostats and coccidiocytes or coccidiocytal drugs. Um, the major difference here is that the coccidiostats will not really kill the coccidia in the animal. So if you feed it and there is an infection, those animals will sort of be um, still having the coccidia, but they are arrested in their development. So they're sort of um, put on hold. And if you feed the coccidia stats long enough, they will eventually die because they starve. Um, uh, so the parasites, not the animals. Um, but the coccidiocidal drugs would work another route. They would directly um, kill those parasites upon um, contact. So that would mean um, they would work more quickly. Um, so if you use coccidiostats, that would just um, be one caveat here um, that you would have to be aware that you have to use them for a really long period of time in order to make sure that once you withdraw them from, uh, from the animals, um, they don't just go on with the life cycle where they ended when you stopped it with the coccidiostat. So looking on uh, what is on the market, there's quite a lot out there, but unfortunately only few of them are made for use in small ruminants. So if we're looking at the coccidiostats, uh, we would have decoquinate or decox, which is used in sheep and goats. Um, if we look at the coccidiocytes, we would have um, Bovatec here for sheep. We would have Romancin or Monovet uh, 90 for goats, and that's about it. So that's everything that we have in, as licensed drugs. Um, there is a lot of operations that use amprolium or Corid, um, oftentimes extra label. Um, so that only requires you to see a vet that prescribes it um, for your operation because you cannot just um, use it on your own. Um, everything else that's on the list here is nice and working really good, but it's not um, meant to be used in small ruminants. And for monensin, just um, to stress it once more, I'm sure most of you are aware of that. Um, this is um, quite toxic to sheep. So if you use it in sheep, you have to make sure that the dose is correct not to kill your animals. Um, about the how, so most of them are feed additives. So you would add them to a mineral mix or to the complete feed, whatever you feed them. Um, what's nice about Emprolium or Corid, and this is why it's um, used extra label a lot, there's also a version um, that you can drench directly to the animals or you can put it into the water, which is nice if we're thinking about younger animals, like maybe a week or two of age, um, if you wanna provide them with a prevention, um, that would sort of be this one because they're not eating enough of the solid food to really uh, make sure that they can take up anything of the others. If you mix them into the feed, which is very common, um, just again, overdosing can be toxic um, for most of them, but specifically for monensin. Um, and underdosing is ineffective. So it's good to have a professional feed mill do that to make sure that the dosage is correct and the animals are protected in the right way. And then the question when. So if we're looking at the individual animal, lamp or kit, obviously um, the infection takes place at some point which you don't know exactly because you don't see it. And then um, it takes two to three weeks until the start of the OS chat, OSIS shedding. So when the internal life cycle is concluded, and this is the start of when we can find parasites in the feces. So if you were thinking about a lab analysis, um, people would not be able to tell you anything here, even though the animal is infected and already having a lot of destruction going on in its intestine. Only here at the end of the life cycle, we will be able to see that there are coccidia around. And um, if we look at the treatment time point related to this um, infection period here or incubation period, if you will, um, if, we, if you treat before infection, that would be prophylaxis. 
Um, if you treat in between while the parasite is in there, we would call that metaphylaxis and then therapy starting with when we can see that something is going on. Obviously, um, for the individual animal, it would be a good thing to sort of start here in that area um, to make sure that the damage is not happening in the intestine. So the earlier the tr you treat, um, the higher are the chances to avoid a lot of gut cells being damaged and a lot of diarrhea occurring and a lot of negative impact on your um, herd performance. Um, yeah, so this is just to show that here is the uh, intestine still um, intact. So those would be like a close-up um, picture of the intestine where you can see a lot of you know, smooth surface here. And then once you get to the point where they are done with the life cycle, you will have a lot of holes, a lot of dead cells in here, which is exactly what we are wanting to avoid. The problem is how um, do you know and how does it translate onto a herd level here? Um, so if you look at the whole herd, obviously, um, you have two major issues you have to keep in mind. The first one is um, that over time, your pasture or indoor operation will be more and more contaminated. So that means um, animals may be exposed, make way quicker to the pathogen. And so um, not only more animals will be in, uh, affected by the disease, but also they get younger over time. So you may start with animals um, having a disease at about eight weeks of age in the very beginning of your um, season, but later they will pick it up way quicker because it's like everywhere. And that will um, give you more pronounced clinical signs. The younger they are, the more um, they suffer from it. And then um, you don't know the infection time point, right? So you know your animals are at risk over the whole time period uh, while they are in a specific area where you know coccidia are um, present but you really don't know the exact time point of infection. So that is like the, the key question here. When would you expect them to um, need the treatment? And um, there are two options to figure that out for a specific operation. So the first one is um, just, you know, playing it very safe and start the treatment about the second week of the lambing season or kidding season. Uh, which is very expensive. Um, that would just mean that you would like to protect every animal consistently until they are, you know, about six months of age um, to make sure they don't um, suffer from coccidia any time during their um, susceptible period. Um, but that is expensive and does take a lot of drugs. The second would be to really sort of figure out a timeline for your operation. Um, and check your herd um, consistently, so like weekly or biweekly um, for um, coccidia burdens and see when lambs start or kids start getting positive. And then you know that you have to, to take action. Um, this seems to be very costly because you have um, repeated lab um, examinations here. So you need uh, the lab to analyze multiple samples to tell you if lambs are good or if they are excreting coccidia and you should be wary about it. Um, but actually it would save you a lot of treatment costs. And the point is once you do that, say in year one, um, you can sort of maybe do it again in year two. And if it looks very similar, like timeline wise, so you, you know, and in the first year it was April, second year, it seems to be April as well. That sort of would give you a general schedule that you know in your operation, the way your um, lambing or kidding season goes, it's probably this time of the year where you have to start it. And so you don't have to have endless lab testing. It's just to give you an idea how your operation works. And probably it's very similar from year to year. So um, I would obviously encourage you to do the second, um, just so you know what's going on. And it's not like, you know, a little blind treatment. Um, which is costly and po potentially um, not necessary. Um, but I would like to have your input on the next question. Um, do you actually do that and send out fecal samples to a lab to see if coccidia are around or when they are around? 
I have to say I'm a, I'm surprised that so many of you already did some lead testing so far. Um, I appreciate it, um, but I can see why um, about half of you would say that you figure it out yourselves because if you have clinical signs um, and you know that coccidia were around for some, um, you know, at some point, then it's probably easy to put one and one together and say I have to treat. But it's really nice that you know some of you have that lab diagnosis, so it really enables you to sort of um, start a more um, precise treatment. So thank you. So then the question is when. So if you have a lab test or you have a clinical science, it's easy to set a like starting point of your treatment. So the question is for how long would you do that? And there are a few recommendations around that say year-round feeding would be nice to just suppress the general population of the coccidia. Actually, I would not really recommend that because not only is it very expensive, but also you would have the risk of resistance development. We do only have a few drugs around um, as we've seen before. So if you use them consistently, it's like you know bacteria and antibiotics. After you use them for a while, there will be drug resistances. So the efficiency of the drugs will uh, lower, will be lowered. So if you do that on, on your operation a lot, it might be that some of the drugs might not be uh, as useful as they used to be. And that would be very um, dangerous since we don't have a lot of um, drugs to sort of rotate around. Then sort of linked to that is the question, which animals would you um, treat? So would you treat your whole herd? Um, I would say probably it's good to treat a whole group of susceptible animals. So the young animals within, within like the first maybe two months of age, maybe a little longer depending on the operation and treat them long enough. So most of the manufacturers recommend about 28 days of treatment. Um, and I would not go under that just especially with the, you know, with the coccidiostats that if you withdraw them, the coccidia will go on with their life cycle. So just make sure that you don't under, uh, like you don't have a too short period of time um, to make it efficient. And then also the dosage is important. So check the feed intake, especially in the young animals to make sure that they really get what they are supposed to get. Um, then the question is, would you treat the ewes? Obviously the ewes are the reservoir. So they would also have like a little bit of, um, Parasites, not a lot because they have their immunity, but if they are around, um, they will always carry like a, a low burden of parasites um, that goes onto the lambs or kids. But if you treat those use again, that will increase your uh, risk of drug resistance besides having higher costs. And since um, you can expect your animals to pick up something, at least if it's not like the very first born lambs or kids, they will always pick up something that the other youngsters have left around. So there's really not much use in treating um, the mothers. Um, I would focus on the youngers. All right, so then just a couple of words. I'm sorry, I'm running so long today. Um, it's, not, it's not a lot more. <laughs> um, the supportive care. Um, just to mention it, obviously, if you have really sick animals, you need to do something about that. It's mainly about maintaining their um, fluid balance. Um, so have some oral electrolytes would be very handy. Uh, make sure the feed is palatable so they eat it because that is where most of the anticoxidials are administered. Um, pre and probiotics have proven to be um, beneficial because they sort of stabilize the bacteria in the gut. So you don't have a lot of secondary infections going on and potentially use antibiotics if needed um, to target those secondary infections. And the secondary infections, um, just to touch on that, um, this would be a gut um, like a cross section or longitudinal section. So you can see here, those would be intact, um, uh, intact gut cells here on the surface. And once the coccidia enter and destroy them, that gives sort of lesions in the gut. And a lot of pathogenic bacteria will just settle onto that, like here, where you have like a lot of cells missing and the bacteria will settle onto that broken surface and that will give you a lot of additional damage. So that can prolong the diarrhea, can prolong clinical signs and will lead to additional weight loss. 
some of our um, anticoxidials like um, Bovatec, for example, they would also have an antibacterial effect. So they are antibiotics. Um, so they would sort of take care of both, but depending on which of, um, of uh, the anticoxidial drugs you use, you might consider to um, um, add some antibiotics in if needed. Then alternative control measures. Um, I might just skip the related question here um, to the sake of time. Um, and just a few sentences about that. So the, the whole purpose behind is that there are measures you could take without using actual drugs. Um, and those are, you know, plant parts or plant um, extracts that have proven to be very effective and can also be used on organic operations, which is nice. Um, there's a lot of um, studies into oregano oil or other essential oils and also like feeding some of um, specific protein sources like Sinefoin here or the Coropod. Um, it might be a little more expensive, but it would sort of replace your drug treatment. Um, the results are so-so, so it helps, but it's not as effective as chemical treatment. So, but if you are an, orga an organic operation, it might be something to use um, rather than not using anything. All right, so then I would like to um, finish up. <laughs> the take home message, I just would have one more question for you here. What would you think is like, what are take home messages for you today? Thank you so much for answering this. Yes, so um, I would agree with all of them. The last one, um, maybe you don't even need that yearly monitoring once you are sort of um, set in a fixed schedule which you experience that it works, but definitely, I mean, it does support the information that you have. Um, I appreciate that um, some of you sort of filter that out here. I would still summarize it very quickly. So the correct diagnosis is important. If you make it by clinical observations or if you have that lab um, analysis on top, it's just sure, um, important to make sure that it's coccidiosis and not any other disease you're dealing with. Um, then combine preventive measures. So this is really like my major key um, take home message. Really make sure that you have different um, approaches to controlling it and not just using the um, chemical treatments because they won't work efficiently if you know you still have all the coccidia around and the animals are still sort of um, struggling with a lot of other issues in parallel. The monitor the herd um, to make sure you, you have a targeted timing of your treatment. And then again, uh, we are not able to eliminate the parasites at all but it might be possible to reduce the impact and really to sort of improve efficiency of the operation. So with that, I'm so sorry I went so long. Um, I'll be happy to take any questions. Is, is coccidia something that the animals can pick up in both the grass and the water? Yes, they can, yeah. Okay, and there was a related one. Let me get back up to it. Um, how long does coccidia live in the environment outside of the animal? That's a great question. So um, they can survive up to two years roughly. Most of them will have died after a year, but they are able to survive from one lambing or kidding season to the next, yeah. Okay. Uh, this question is related to a cold weather climate and if there's a difference in infection rate if you lamb in the spring versus the fall. That is, that is a very good question. Um, I would say not so much because the coccidia would have to um, survive for, you know, the same time amount of time and they would have to overwinter anyways. So I guess like your, your um, starting point would be quite similar, yeah. Except for maybe the question, if you if you only put your animals on pasture like over the spring to fall season, then probably fall might be a little more at risk because the old animals had more time to contaminate it um, over summer. But if you're having like a year-round operation, I think that the difference would not be too big. Okay. Uh, the next question is, can you reduce the coccidia load by segregating lambs by age during lambing? 
And if so, how often would you need to start a new group to reduce the infection cycle? Yeah, so definitely, I would say um, that helps a lot from what I've seen so far. Um, I would say if you could start a new group about every month, that might be a good starting point for most operations. Okay. Depending, uh, of course, on the size of the operation. Sure, yeah. Um, okay, with respect to disinfecting, would you use uh, straight bleach or is there a dilution ratio that you would recommend? Oh, yeah, thanks for asking that. Um, I would say about a, yeah, about a 10%, 10 to 15% solution would be good. Okay. Um, for one week to eight week old lambs, can they get coccidiosis from their mothers while nursing if the udders are dirty? So in theory, they could. I think the udders are not a major source of infection because of the um, environmental part of the life cycle. So most of them will, will be around in the environment. They could be some stuck to the udder after, you know, after fulfilling the environmental part of the life cycle and being infective. But I guess the, the major issue is like the grass itself. Okay. So this is an interesting one. Um, would there be any issues for the livestock guardian dogs to drink the same water if it's treated with amprolium? Right, the amprolium. So I may be mistaken, but I don't think there are any amprolium preparations on the market for dogs, which means it's not intended um, to, be, to be used in dogs. I'm, I'm not aware that there would be any toxicity towards dogs, but I'm not 100% sure, honestly. So it might be worth checking in before you yeah. do it. Yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you address the use of thymine when treating goats with anti-coccidial uh, stats? Yeah, yeah, thank you. So this is because some of them will, will um, sort of deprive um, the organism of a thiamine because they were like, um, you could say like, like um, they are competing with a thiamine. So this is because those um, parasites, they need a lot of thiamine um, for the replication. And if they are deprived of it, um, they cannot replicate. The problem here is that obviously the host itself will also need thiamine, which is a vitamin. Um, so you might um, have a good effect if you supplement it to make sure that your young animal is not having like nervous symptoms or something like that because the brain and all the nerves they will need a lot of thiamine so this is just to balance what you what you sort of take away by the drug that you replenish it for the animal okay um, this question is related to ensuring that um, you don't hurt young lambs if you're trying to collect a fecal sample can you uh, tell us the best way to go about doing that yeah, so if it's just a herd screening, you can definitely collect that from the ground because there is no environmental contamination. It's sort of different from if you have a bacterial, you know, a bacterial swap something that needs to be fresh. This is not true for parasites. So you can collect it from the ground if you wish. Um, if you just want to have like a state for your for your animal group. If you wanted to collect them individually, um, I would say if you, you know, if you wear a glove and you have a little bit of moisture on it and, you know, you, you can get rectal samples without hurting the animal quite well, just make sure you have a little bit of lubrication used. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to just grab a couple more questions. There are quite a few here. Um, are you comfortable with these guys emailing you with questions that we don't get to today? Absolutely. Yeah, please go ahead. I'm happy to, to get in contact okay. with them. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm sure that your email address is listed on um, the University of Wyoming website, but also you can contact me and, and I'll pass along the question. Um, Thank you. Um, so would the best practice in high intensive indoor kidding to be creep feeding the young animals um, with a coccidiocidal in feed? Yes, that would be that would be very good if we could do that. 
um, again, it depends a little bit on the age of the animals when they are infected. If they are very young, you might not be able to, to get the dosage into the animal at the right age. But um, if that works on an operation time-wise, that would be a really good solution, yes. Okay. Um, so at this point, I think we'll go ahead and um, let our speaker go. I really appreciate you uh, for joining us and visiting with us about this topic. I think uh, based on our attendance today, it was an, it's a needed topic. So um, thank you again. I oh, no, thank you. I appreciate that I had the opportunity and I would appreciate any more questions. So I'm happy again to, to take any questions by email. Yes. All right. Thank you. Have thank a great you. day, you guys.